gentlemen, this is Mr. Los. Welcome to another exciting edition of HL Chemistry Flipped Classroom. Glad you're here with me today. It's time to get excited, time to get hyped. We're going to be talking about, if I could go back, data analysis and graphing, you know, what we do with data, how we interpret it, and uh, how we put it onto a graph. So let's get cracking here. Um, some terms you may have heard me throw around before, but just to define them formally here, accuracy versus precision. Accuracy is how close a measurement is to the so-called true value, whatever that might be. And precision uh, can mean a couple of different things. Um, if you're doing an experiment and you're doing many trials, that's how close your values are together. Or you could use that word to refer to the sensitivity of a measuring device. In other words, you might look at that as how many uh, digits past a decimal does this device give you. So let's look at some examples here. The, the classic example is the bullseye. Um, assuming we're trying to hit the target here, uh, these, and this is where the darts hit, these darts are neither precise nor accurate. These darts are precise, but they're not accurate because they're closely grouped together, but they're not in the bullseye. And then in this case, those darts could be precise and accurate both. Um, Another example here, and I don't think there's a need for you to write these this specific example down, but just to give you a for instance. So, um, so suppose we have a mass of lead here, and we happen to know the true, so-called true mass of this lead is 65.3500 grams. And so maybe to test these balances, we are weighing them on three different brands of electric balance. Um, one thing I would point out to you is Again, given that other word of the use of precision, we could say that uh, brand B is a more precise balance if we're using that if we're using the digits past the decimal definition of the word. So it's a, again, it's it's kind of confusing because it can mean different things. Um, I could say brand B at least is intended or it's supposed to be the most precise balance because it gives us three digits past the decimal whereas these only give two, these have equal precision. So um, leaving aside that part of the definition, uh, I'd like you to look at these balances and see for a second which ones, if we could describe them as being in these repeated trials, are they precise in the repeated trials? Are they accurate in the repeated trials? Are they neither? Are they both? And uh, we'll, we'll stop the video here and you can Try, see what you think. Okay, so um, hopefully you came up with this balance is precise in that all three of these things are varying, but they're only varying by 0.01 grams. So that's within the uncertainty of this, uh, of this device. So we could certainly say that these three measurements, these three trials are precise, but they are not accurate because they're fairly far off from the expected value. Um, Brand B, uh, I would argue, when we're again when we're talking about the repeated measurements version of precision, these repeated measurements are not precise. They're fairly far off. They're farther off than the supposed the supposed uncertainty of the measuring device, um, and they're not really all that accurate either, um, especially this middle one. So I would kind of describe those as neither. This last one is precise or and accurate both. Um, yes, they are varying by 0.01 gram, but that's within the uncertainty of the device, so that's fine. So I would call these repeated measurements both precise and accurate. Um, so moving on from that, we're going to talk about the characteristics of a good graph. And you know, a lot of this stuff is stuff that you guys should know, but still it's worth reminding and making sure that we have uh, everything that we're supposed to have on graphs. A graph should have a descriptive title. People, I find, students really struggle with putting good titles on graphs and data tables. The, the, the title should tell you exactly what the graph or data table shows and what it has in it. And I'll show you some examples here in a second. Of course, we should label our axes. We should put units on it. Um, we should have enough grid lines, the lines in between, so that we can read with accuracy of values. The scaling should be appropriate. Um, you want to have you want to have even scaling. You want to have scaling that's not misleading. You want to use the space well. You know, if if generally the bigger the graph is, the better. So if you have the space, if it's possible, a whole page graph is awesome. Um, 
Our graph should communicate the uncertainty in our measurements somehow. I, uh, error bars is a good way to do that. And again, we'll look at some examples. Um, the data point should be visible. Sometimes with a computer-generated graph, you can have not visible data points, which IB doesn't like, and it's not a very good thing in general. Um, and generally, we want to plot the dependent variable on the y-axis and the independent variable on the x-axis. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Don't make your graphs backwards. Uh, visible data points, that was already on the last slide. Um, we should put a trend line, uh, what you might have heard referred to as a best fit line on your graph, and the equation for that trend line, and R squared or RMSC value, whenever it's possible and appropriate. Not all graphs is it even appropriate to put a trend line on there. Um, we're going to talk more about what R squared and RMSC mean, but let's just talk for a second about when it's appropriate to have a trend line. Well, first of all, both axes must be quantitative. They must be actual measurements. Um, you know, like if one of your axes is trial one, trial two, trial three, that's not really a quantitative thing. That's not really a measurement. So if one of your axes was trial one, two, three, four, you could not and should not have a trend line. Um, and what we're doing with our trend line or our best fit lines, we're trying to establish a relationship. What is the relationship between our two variables? What is the relationship between X and Y? That relationship is not necessarily linear. These variables can be related by a bunch of different things. You should consider the origin should be forced to be on your trend line or if it should be a part of your graph. So you should think about the point zero, zero on your graph. What does that mean in that particular graph? Um, in some cases, you, you know, we know for a fact that 0, 0 should be on there, and in other cases, maybe not. So if 0, 0 logically should be on there, you should put it on there and force your trend line to go through it, um, otherwise not. And you know, we'll look at a couple of examples here to hopefully clarify this a little bit and a lot of this stuff in here. Um, but just some quick examples of graphs. Again, you don't have to sketch these or anything, but this is obviously a terrible graph. It has no units. It has no title. It, you know, we can't tell anything from this graph. There's two different lines. No telling what's going on. Um, here's a graph that's a little bit better, at least. It's got an axis and a label. It's got more grid lines. It's got another label down here. It's got a trend line. The title um, just says graph. You know, I see this a lot. This is not a descriptive title. This doesn't mean anything. So if if I was uh, grading this, you would get probably no points for making the title of your graph graph or the title of your data table data table. I, I see that even more commonly. Don't do that. Um, so here's a much better graph that has most of the features, if not all, that I described there. This one was made in Logger Pro, and we're going to learn how to do that. It's a, It might be a little bit hard to see, um, but you see, it's got a good descriptive title that tells us exactly what's going on. It's got labeled axes. It's got plenty of grid lines. It's got a trend line. It's got the equation for that trend line and some more info there. It has error bars here, uh, which we can set. Just they show the uncertainty. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we're going to be looking for when we do graphs. So let's talk some more about trend lines and, and what they mean and what they're supposed to do and R squared and RMSC. What we are trying to do as scientists and as someone who's making a graph and as someone who's putting a trend line on our graph, um, we're trying to model the natural world. We're trying to model what our experiment is doing and hopefully our experiment also in turn models the natural world, the universe. So, you know, ideally the equation for a trend line could be used to make predictions about things we didn't directly test in our experiment. So we're trying to sort of mathematically model what the, what the universe is doing. And our squared values and RMSC values are trying to give us an idea of how useful our trend line is um, and how accurately it's modeling the data. Um, R squared is the coefficient of determination. And you know there's a lot of statistics that go behind these calculations. And I don't know if it's necessary for us to get into too much depth. But it has to do with how well or what is the degree of correlation between x and y, or how much of the variation in the y-axis can be explained by the variation in the x-axis. And the closer it is to 1, so you want an R-squared value to show a strong correlation. The R-squared value should be uh, as close as possible to 1. Um, it relates correlation, uh, which is not necessarily always causation. Now let me tell you what I mean by that, just with a little example here. Um, 
suppose I just have this data where it says tomatoes eaten monthly, so how many tomatoes someone eats in a month um, versus the incidence of cancer. And when we see this, we notice, so tomatoes eating is increasing here. So if we look at this data, it, it seems as if the more um, tomatoes are being eaten in a given month, the less incidence of cancer that there is. Now the question is, does this mean that eating tomatoes prevents cancer? Well, um, not necessarily at all. It depends on a lot of things. Um, maybe the type of person who eats a lot of tomatoes is also doing other things that tend to help prevent cancer. Maybe they, uh, maybe they eat a healthy diet in general, maybe they get a lot of exercise or whatever. I mean, who knows? But there is a correlation here um, the more tomatoes that are eaten, the less cancer. There is a correlation here, but it does not necessarily mean that eating tomatoes is actually causing or preventing cancer, I should say. Um, so R squared and really RMSC doesn't necessarily tell us about causation. It kind of depends on, on a lot of things. Now, if this study had been done to control a, a bunch of other variables and tomato eating was the only thing that was changing, um, we would have a lot better info here. But, but just as is, just with the information, just with the graph in front of us, um, this evidence is not really strong enough to say that eating tomatoes prevents cancer. It's a correlation, but not necessarily a causation. Um, RMSC is a similar in the sense it's another way of kind of seeing how our variables are related. It stands for root mean squared error. Um, basically, it is, here's your, wherever your trend line is, it's how far on average these points are from the trend line. Um, so the, with the best trend line, our, all of our points would be right on the trend line, so RMSC would be zero. So the closer it is to zero, the more um, the points are on the trend line. So this is just another, some, some examples. You don't need to sketch these graphs or anything, but this is showing an R squared value. We've got an equation for the trend line. Um, the R squared value is relatively high. It's pretty close to one. Most of the points are on the line, so that makes sense. Uh, one, another way to interpret R squared is to say that 99.1% of the Y variation is due to the X variable. Um, here's an indirect relationship. Uh, the R squared is a little bit higher. The points are not necessarily really on the line. Um, they're close to the line, but not necessarily on it. So again, one way to interpret this is to say 82% of the Y variation is due to the X variable. What is that caused by? Um, is it experimental error? Is it something else? Is it, um, you know, maybe our trend, our, our whole relationship, the way we're thinking about it is wrong. Maybe this equation's wrong. Um, you know, who knows? Um, I put this up just to show some of the things that we were talking about in relationships to graphs, and this is this is pretty old. This was from when George W. Bush was president, and it's about, I'm guessing, um, this is from Fox News, but some tax cuts that George Bush had put in place were possibly going to expire. So I'd like you to take a look at this graph, see if you think there's any problems with it, um, and what those are. So there's a number of problems with this. Um, one of them, I would say the most glaring problem is the scaling. The graph does not start at zero. And I think this is an intentionally misleading graph to make it seem like there's gonna be a bigger difference than there is. There's uh, the, the, the tax rate is going from 35% to 39.6%, which is, you know, it's definitely an increase. But the way this graph is scaled makes it seem like the tax rate is like quadrupling or something um, when really it's only going up you know a little bit so that's the biggest problem with this and and it just goes to show that we need to be careful with graphs that we see in science that we see in the news um, because they can be misleading and sometimes intentionally so uh, here's another graph um, what I'd like you to do is take a look at this graph think about uh, what it shows you, and I'd like you to think about what, if anything, this says about the most dangerous group of drivers. In other words, what age of drivers are the most dangerous?
Okay, so in looking at this graph, you know, it's tempting to say that since 25 to 34 year olds uh, are involved in the most fatal accidents, then they are the most dangerous group of drivers. But I think that's probably not true. I think it's a correlation, but not a causation thing happening here. Um, the other factor that you may or may not have considered is there is a lot less drivers who are 19 and under on the road, and there's also a lot less drivers who are over 75 on the road. Um, I think these groups are the, involved in the most fatal accidents simply because they are probably by far the biggest group that's actually out there on the road driving. Um, what would be more helpful is what is the number of fatal accidents per driver of a certain age? and. I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing that by that system, um, the youngest drivers would actually be the most dangerous because they have a relatively high number of fatalities and probably one of the lower uh, numbers of drivers out there on the road. So again, we see a misleading graph, um, potentially misleading if you interpret it incorrectly. So just be careful with how we, we interpret graphs. Some other terms is interpolation and extrapolation. Interpolation is using your data points to make predictions within the values that you have measured. So we're, we're within the range that our experiment measured. Extrapolation is taking your data set and moving it to make predictions outside the range that you tested. So um, let's take a look at some examples here. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to sketch this graph unless you really think it, it will help in your understanding of this, but just to look at it as an example. Um, so let's say we just did a really simple experiment. We just took some water and we heated it up. We put a thermometer in the water or something and we just took a data point every 10 minutes and that's what we got and we made a, we made a trend line. So in the, the interpolation range is anywhere within here where we actually measured. So for instance, we could interpolate, we could say, what will be the temperature after heating for 15 minutes? We didn't actually measure it 15 minutes, but um, we could make that interpolation. So go ahead and do that now. Okay, so to make this interpolation, we can go to 15 minutes, we can slide up, we can slide across, looks like about 35 degrees Celsius. So just read directly from the graph, that's our interpolation. So extrapolation is when we extend this line beyond what we actually measured. So we stopped our experiment after 50 minutes, but we could use our trend line, we could extend it and, and attempt to make predictions about things that we didn't actually measure. So again, this goes to how accurately is our trend line modeling na the natural world. So now we could extrapolate what will be the temperature after heating for 70 minutes and what will be the temperature after heating for 80 minutes. Okay, so 70 minutes, if we scroll on up there from there, it appears it's supposed to be about 90 degrees Celsius. 80 minutes, scroll on up, it's supposed to be about 100 degrees Celsius. Except, here's the problem. Um, extrapolation is kind of dangerous. It's kind of a trick question. If we were doing this experiment here in Colorado, the water would never reach 100 degrees Celsius because in Colorado, um, the boiling point of water, at least in Aurora, is about 95 or so. And so what would happen is the water would start boiling and it actually would probably stay at about 94, 95. So in Colorado, the, the, the boiling point would never reach 100 degrees Celsius. And this is the danger of extrapolation and this is the danger of um, making thinking our trend line is, is better than it really is, especially when we extrapolate and especially when we don't have any information about what's going on up here. It's, it's, it can be very dangerous to make assumptions about what's happening when we extrapolate data. Not to say it can't be done and not to say that extrapolation isn't useful, but it just you need to come with a warning that in some cases it wouldn't work. Like if you're boiling water in Colorado, uh, this would not work. Um, let's talk quick about some relationships between variables that they could possibly be. You could have a direct proportion uh, where variables are increasing together. So when one goes up, the other goes up. Or you could have indirect where one goes down, the other goes down. Um, 
if there is a linear indirect relationship, when you graph them, it's going to look a little bit like this. And I would suggest you at least very quickly sketch, if nothing else, at least the shape, the general shape of an indirect relationship. Notice how it's like going down like that, and it's not a straight line. Um, this is just a complete made up, obviously, value here just to show an indirect relationship. But I probably would sketch that really quickly. One thing that seems to come up in IB is how we could make a graph that's not a straight line into a straight line. And one thing you could do if you wanted to have straight line data for some maybe mathematical reason is instead of graphing dingbats versus wingnuts like that, we graph dingbats versus 1 over wingnuts. And when we do that, if the relationship is indirect, you'll produce a straight line like that going up. So something just to keep in mind, one way we can turn a indirect relationship which has a curved line, slightly harder to work with mathematically, into a straight line. Um, some other relationships that you could have is exponential, like population growth. Oftentimes, human population growth, for sure, is exponential. So it increases like that. Um, you could have a logarithmic, where something goes up and then it tends to level off. That's a logarithmic type relationship, and there's there's you know there's lots of others. Um, there's other relationships, but keep in mind, especially if you're just doing an experiment, your variables might not be related, or when you graph them, you might not be able to discern or figure out a relationship. So that could basically mean two things: it could mean there really isn't a relationship between your variables; they're just totally unrelated; they don't have anything to do with each other, or they might have a relationship, but your experiment failed to show it for whatever reason, experimental error, etc. cetera. Um, so that's about it, folks. You know, I think the take home message here is exercise caution when interpreting all types of graphs, um, the ones you make, and maybe even especially ones you see in the news or ones you see with people who might have a certain agenda because um, they can be misleading, sometimes intentionally. So be careful when we interpret our graphs uh, and data in general, but other than that, guys, have a great day, and we'll see you next time.